Well, hello. We are uh, now going to have the session on the search for investment yield. And we have a panel with a variety of experience here to tell us how they search for investment yield. Uh, we have uh, Barbara Ann Bernard, who specializes in equities. We have uh, Brett Hickey, who is in the private credit area. We have Mackenzie Slaughter, who is crypto and will, well, she's not crypto, but she specializes in crypto. And we have Bart uh, Turtleboom, who's got long experience, including with the IMF in emerging market debt. So uh, hopefully everyone listening will find something of interest among uh, the four panelists that I'm going to introduce. Uh, I'm Jim McCurkin. I've been managing investment management companies for many years. And uh, so I'm a jack of all trades as far as the investment world is concerned. The search for investment yield, I would suggest, is one of the defining questions of investment markets right now. The reason why yield is hard to find is plainly demographic. The aging population in the rich world, in the wealthy parts of the world, it's an aging population that is seeking to turn assets into income for retirement. And whether that happens by them directly easy monetary policy, starting in the global financial crisis through various problems like the euro crisis in 2010, and of course, COVID in the last uh, 14 months or so, those crises have led to very easy monetary policy and very low interest rates. So apart from the weight of buying, this has been a very difficult time to be looking for investment yield. Um, the accelerated adoption of technology is another factor that has made yield quite scarce. And you've seen that in other periods of technological change in the past, particularly, for example, in the middle of the 19th century. Um, through all kinds of economic situation, uh, the technology change during that period was comparable in, in stress and comparable in pace to now. And it was very deflationary and uh, led to an extended period then of very low interest rates. Um, there's a number of reasons why technology is deflationary, but it's mainly to do with it keeping prices down and uh, allowing price discovery to be done in a very um, efficient way. So the, I would expect with these fundamental factors, primarily demographics and technology, I'd expect the search for yield to be something that drives market participants for several years to come, certainly for, for likely the next five years. There is um, a debate about the possibility of inflation, uh, partly related to the ease of fiscal and monetary policies, and that could happen. But I would suggest rates are likely to stay lower for longer than most market commentators suggest. And I'd point to Japan which has had expansionary and very easy monetary policies for 30 years now. But because of the demographics and because the Japanese have been quick adopters of technology, it's stayed in a deflationary kind of financial market with very low rates. Um, my own view is that we might all be Japan over the next uh, few years. So with that um, background, I'd like to start by asking the panelists to give us their current best idea to capture some of that investment yield and uh, tell us a bit about that. Uh, maybe we'll start with uh, Barbara, with Barbara Ann Bernard, if you'd let us know a bit about how to do this in the equity market. Oh, no, don't start with me. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so Jim, I, I, um, I, I think your comments on Japan and deflation and demographics are, um, are very interesting. Um, I agree that technology is deflationary um, and that Amazon is basically a price comparison website. And that makes it difficult for consumer companies with a low inflation pass through rate to be able to increase prices. So when we talk about yield and rising bond rates and inflation, what does that mean? It, in my world, it means margin compression for companies with a low inflation pass through rate. 
But I also think inflation is an equal risk and opportunity. And where I see opportunity is in things like commodities. If you were building a house, you would notice that lumber is up 96% year on year. So while you're not having inflation, I don't expect the price of your TV to double because that com- Samsung can't double the price. Um, in commodities, I think there's a real way to monetize um, some of these inflationary trends. And I don't think technology helps escape that. So, um, And I think you know, if you look at the equity markets, by anyone's metric, they're pretty expensive. But if you look at commodities, they're generationally cheap. And uh, what I'd also say is with the Biden win, you now have this synchronized global green wave um, of people trying to green the grid. And that's going to put a tremendous amount of pressure on scarce resources such as nickel and copper. And then if you can find companies that are mining in a sustainable way, they get green bonds and in some cases grants from the government. So there you have a rising commodity price, a falling cost of capital, which results in tremendous operating leverage and, you know, and, and, a, and a great return. So, um, so when you think about yield, you know, is it, is it, you know, yeah, sure. You can think about a stock with a high dividend yield um, or is it growing your portfolio and selling something to live on? Right. And when, when, when you think about how do you retire off of, off of your savings and, um, but I, I agree the 60-40 portfolio is really challenged right now because yield is so hard to come by. Um, so I'll leave it there. But. But thank you. We'll come back to risks in a moment because clearly with all these ideas, what can go wrong is something we have to think about. So Barbara, put you on notice that that one's coming later. But uh, Brett, tell us about your best ideas. Sure. Uh, as you mentioned, Jim, we have an aging demographic and one of the benefits of the aging demographic is that you have a lot of private business owners, particularly in the developed countries, the U.S., I'll focus on where we do, that are looking to do something with their businesses. Many people over the last few decades have realized that passing their companies on multi-generationally to their children is not always the best plan. And so now a lot of business owners are looking to exit their companies and you have other businesses looking to buy them. Uh, on top of that, as Barbara mentioned, you have all-time public market highs, which makes the valuation arbitrage between a smaller private business and a larger business uh, bigger than ever. So with the aging demographic and the valuation arbitrage, there are a lot of private business owners that are looking to make acquisitions and grow their businesses. That all sounds easy, but for anybody who's made acquisitions and had to integrate them and deal with all the dynamics from personnel to customers and so forth, there's a lot of complexity. So one of the ways that um, investors can look to generate alpha is looking for more complex strategies where you can get paid for services and labor, not just getting paid for risk. And in this case, it's taking advantage of the retiring demographic, which represents about 50% of U.S. GDP, so it's a, it's a big market of established private businesses in the U.S. in particular. So that's an opportunity because it, it's hard to access. It's not had the capital inflows that the larger markets have had because it's both supply and demand that matter. A lot of credit has had massive inflows for many of years, and as a result of that, you know, yields are very low in anything – quick, easy, and efficient to access. So our view generally at Star Mountain is that the risk-reward of the quick, easy markets is generally not great because it's just so competitive and there's such little barriers to entry. The second way that people can look to take advantage of that same marketplace dynamic is both with aging business owners and aging fund managers. So we all know of the big Blackstones, Blackrocks of the world, but there are hundreds of small little asset managers that have a few hundred million in assets under management, most of which have not built succession planning, have portfolios they're looking to sell of mature loans, preferred equity assets, and so forth. And so there's a strategy now people call secondaries where you're buying LP interest and assets on a secondary basis, often looking to buy them on a discounted basis where you can buy a diversified portfolio of limited partnership interests of private credit assets. That can be another, again, pretty complex way of 
hunting for alpha and hunting for higher yield. So, Brett, you're talking about private credit, but with an emphasis on distinguishing a, the, your way of access and getting a deal flow that might otherwise not present itself to you. Yes, and, and thank you, Jim, for clarifying. One of the important variables, there's a few things that systematically either bring more efficiency or inefficiency. One is size of company. So generally speaking, if your business does over 30 million of EBITDA, it's probably going to be a pretty efficient market. Having started my career at a bulge bracket investment bank in Wall Street, I always like to say, if you can hire Goldman Sachs to be your banker, that's probably a reasonably efficient market. Yeah. So you need to get a business small enough that you can't go hire Goldman Sachs or, or pick up a, a pure equivalent. Um, the second thing is who owns the business. Uh-huh. If the business is owned by a well-established private equity firm, most of whom are former investment bankers and so forth, they're likely going to run a really efficient capital markets process to get very cost-effective debt. Good for them, not so good for the lender. So what Star Mountain does and, and other folks that are looking for less efficient processes is look for founder and owner-operated businesses, which the industry calls non-sponsored. Yeah. So, uh, Mackenzie, um, you're very interested in and in, involved in crypto. And, uh, you know, the older generations of investment manager are probably to generalize skeptical, but they haven't been right yet. So uh, I think the burden, I think the, the bias from what crypto has done is on your side. However, we also think about crypto as being a bit like electronic gold or silver, which means no income. Uh, Maybe you can clarify how you would think of this in a retirement portfolio. Sure. Um, Well, right now, how we're seeing crypto play out in retirement portfolios is just holding Bitcoin, right? Um, Holding Bitcoin, hoping that it will offset that inflation. But that's not working. Um, It's not working. Why? Because the Bitcoin price is going to go down eventually. And this bull market is going to come to an end. Um, soon. So in exchange, you know, um, the alternative to that would be decentralized finance. And that is on the Ethereum blockchain, the Ethereum network. Um, They've done a really good job improving um, that you can do, uh, you can do everyday financial transactions without a middleman. Um, Probably not what everyone wants to hear (laughs) uh, here, here. But um, using the technology to, uh, you know, execute a loan in seconds uh, without a mortgage, a mortgage officer or um, or uh, take out or do trades, you know, using trading crypto trading bots. And so there's a lot of things going on. I don't want to talk about the technology and get really specific, but I think that um, what I'm starting to see is digital asset funds that are using uh, decentralized finance within decentralized finance, or we call it DeFi, there are about six strategies for yield. There are six yield, six specific yield strategies. And basically, um, basically you hold your crypto in these DeFi exchanges and you earn interest. That's the simplest, the simplest way to explain it. Uh, The simplest way to explain it. So these exchanges, um, much like a NASDAQ or a um, uh, like a NASDAQ, but for your cryptocurrency, um, you hold it in their custody and they will trade it. They will uh, put it in liquidity pools or mining pools for you and you will earn interest. So it's not like you're going to be sitting in front of your computer and trading all day to try to get that interest, um, to try to get that yield. So the mo- so the the key motivator here is that there has to be someone who's ready to borrow crypto and pay interest on it. Yes, and that is it's a pretty big network uh, or pretty big market already. There's eighty eight by eighty eight billion dollars already ready being distributed in these DeFi exchanges. So um, and there um, so there is a lot of liquidity. Well, that's not a lot of liquidity compared to regular to compare to equities, but it's growing liquidity and it's growing every day. And it's I think it's uh, um, there have been a couple of pension funds and institutional investors that have there are currently testing this out right now. And um, so it's, if it's enough liquidity for them 
it should be enough liquidity for everybody else. Yeah, the next round of questions I'm going to, you know, push out to people are really around what can go wrong, where are the risks, and how do you mitigate them? So we'll return to that, Mackenzie. But I think it's a, a very interesting, um, very interesting, and probably slightly unfamiliar to most people um, idea. Uh, Bart, your background is very deep and quite long in emerging market debt, which uh, I might have thought of a few years ago as a relatively high risk way to get an income. But I think nowadays it's become kind of mainstream. Um, are the yields still enough? Is it something you can do a lot for uh, for these uh, retirement accounts with? It's, a, it's an interesting question, Jim, because... I'm blessed to be in an asset class emerging markets where over the decades, people always overpay for growth and underpay for cash flows. Mm -hmm. So there, there is a, a structural risk premium uh, in the asset class, which I do believe is there to, is to be earned and, 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 and does fit in, in retirement accounts. And actually, not only does it fit in it, by now the corporate debt market in emerging markets is so large that in most of these accounts you will actually um, find it. We see for us the, the best opportunity in, in a very specific part of the private credit spectrum. If somebody wants to build out a, a chain of pharmacies in Kenya, he will have no problem getting the equity from an emerging markets focused private equity firm. Yeah. He will the, the development finance institutions will fall all over themselves to give him the senior debt. But God forbid that he has expenses and revenue in Kenyan shilling and needs to cover part of the debt burden in local currency and try to go and find that for 10 years. Yeah. There, there is just nobody there. It's, yeah. We're pretty much alone. Yeah. And there we see an incredible opportunity. That missing link between the senior dollar-denominated debt financing and the private equity is where we just see fantastic opportunities. And that could be local currency funding. That could be guarantees on uh, local currency debt. That could be political risk insurance. That could be a plain mezzanine loan in local currency. So we, we see a fantastic opportunity there. The space is completely uncrowded. And uh, that's really our focus now and will be for the next three to five years. And Bart, I guess that in past years, um, your Kenyan pharmacy chain would have used a bank and got its finance from a bank if it could. Uh, but nowadays, of course, the banks have really pulled in on anything that looks risky, and they're probably not present. Would that be an advantage you might have in the bond market? Uh, yes, very much. So it's very clear that if you look at the large financial institutions, global banks, they are really retrenching their home markets. And, and to Brett's point, right, you see such fantastic opportunities in the U.S. private credit market that going and running the reputational risk by doing this stuff in Kenya is, is very risky. I, I always joke to whenever my G7 colleagues, my colleagues who invest in G7 markets in the asset management industry decide to set up an emerging markets fund, I always say, here is the rule. It will always be too small to really be meaningful for your bottom line, but too big not to cause a reputational headache. And I have not been proven wrong once. <laughs> so risks are important. We'll, uh, we'll come back on that topic, um, which I think is really uh, lead, leads us into the next segment, which is, you know, whenever you reach for yield, there are things that can go wrong. And I'd be interested to go around the speakers about, you know, what could go wrong uh, what the risks are, and how they mitigate them. Maybe you could have a go at that one, Barbara. You're on mute. Yes, you're on mute. You're on All right, mute. here we go. Sorry, no, I thought it was um, better if we muted and we weren't speaking. Sorry. Um, so what could go wrong? Yeah, the, the big risk here is um, does the price of money change? Right. And you have so many business models today that um, are being built upon or have the assumption that money is going to be free and therefore profits and cash flow don't matter. 
Um, and if you, and so I'm talking about tech, right? Um, and so if you have a huge sell off in tech, um, how does that impact broader market sentiment? And, you know, Mackenzie alluded to this too. She says, when does the music stop? Um, and I'd love for Mackenzie to pitch in on her thoughts of when does Bitcoin, you know, um, topple? We did say you expected the price to go down. Um, so I think markets are frothy and I see a lot of greed and no fear. Um, so that makes me uh, nervous in and of itself. Um, and, you know, this time last year, if you'd asked me, I would have said Bitcoin and gold were very similar traits. And this year I couldn't say that at all. No. And, you know, gold does well when there's fear in the world. There is no fear. Um, and Bitcoin is going up because people expect it will go up more. Yeah. And I'm not sure that makes it a currency. That makes it an asset. And is that the purpose? And so but they're all one and the same. There's just a lot of liquidity in the system. Um, and I think it's inflated asset prices across the board. And so how do we protect ourselves when the tide turns, in my opinion, is the biggest risk. Yeah. So, Mackenzie, uh, Barbara kind of teed you up there. Yeah. Uh, I would add uh, another thought, which is really just current in the last week or two, which is what about these non-fungible tokens, which somehow equate to works of art and collectibles, even though in many cases they don't have the copyright. So I'm not sure what you really own other than something you can look at. Um, any thoughts on how long this market will go on? I mean, even will it collapse? I'm not sure I necessarily can hand on heart say I know it will. I'd be, I mean, you, you will know much better, more than the rest of us about those risks. So it'd be really interesting to hear. Yeah, these NFTs are starting to get pretty embarrassing. <laughs> embarrassing with Elon Musk, you know, selling his NFT with his music and stuff. I mean, it's just I've seen all kind of stuff uh, being sold right now, which kind of lets me know that this market is just really, you know, it's 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 run its race, right? This is just like how much more, you know? It's just it's it's so bad. I don't want to say that, but. <laughs> Um, it's so bad. It's so ridiculous. Um, and it's almost cartoonish. It's clownish. You know, it doesn't make my industry look very professional. So I hope it comes to an end very soon, very, very soon. Um, back to pointing to what Barbara said, I think that um, Bitcoin, um, I think Bitcoin is slated to go up to a hundred thousand. I mean, that's what everyone is saying. That's what it looks like. Right. Um, but is it going to stay at a hundred thousand? That's my question. And I don't think that it, I don't think that it is. And so what do we do once that goes, once Bitcoin hits a hundred thousand, where do we go from there? Does it go down? And when Bitcoin retracts, it usually retracts by about 80%. So it'll go down by 80 80%. It's, it's projected to go down between twenty dollars and $30,000 um, whenever it, get, it gets done doing whatever it's doing right now. Um, the other issue with within cryptocurrency is even though there are yields, you know, happening, you've, you've seen anywhere from 30, 30 percent to 2,000 percent. It's really crazy right now. But the real risk I see within cryptocurrency and digital assets is the hacking the hacks that are happening, you know, the eight million dollars being taken off of the being taken off an exchange because a smart contract was not um, coded correctly or it wasn't properly audited. It wasn't properly audited. And so those hacks are going to keep happening. I think it's going to just be like the new normal. But how to how to you mitigate how do you mitigate those hacks? Because um, in my world, everything is tech driven. Everything is driven by code. So, you know, that's the hacker's world. They're always they're always going to be there. Um, but how can we um, how can we ensure that the code is up to par so they don't get in and take millions of dollars from from um, hardworking people? Yeah, one of the uh, one of the things I've seen suggested, and I'd be interested if you think this is a possibility, is that uh, the onset and the development of quantum computing is going to so much increase computer power that it'll empower the hackers. 
and hacking could become much more dangerous and much more powerful. Is there anything in that argument, do you believe? Uh, I, I would agree with that. I would definitely um, agree with that, only because of the use of bots. Um, the use It's just an exorbitant use of bots. And, um, and once a hacker, anyone can create a bot. We all can create a bot in less than five minutes, and it can go fine. Um, it can do arbitrage for you. You can find those opportunities, even if they're right or wrong, and if they're right or wrong. So there is no ethical or moral, you know, limits when you're talking about cryptocurrency or DeFi or quantum um, technology. So we quite haven't got there yet. No. So, Brett, uh, what can go wrong in your private credit? I think I heard some of the mitigation already, but... Uh Maybe you can round up on mitigation as well. Yeah, for first thing I would say, and, and as we all think back to the late 90s, perhaps when lots of unicorns turned into black swans once the, the rain hit them, the uh, value of having a diversified portfolio, and when you look at a lot of investors' portfolios today, they're perhaps more concentrated than they've ever been because of some of the large mega tech stocks in particular. And so some of... Um, some sophisticated investors that, that we know quite well are really focused on aggressively looking for true low correlation and, and low beta and, and in things that can have some defensibility and sustainability. Uh, one of the things that's beneficial about the U.S. lower middle market, for example, uh, peanut hauling company, if you think about that as a company that we'd invested in, it doesn't really matter what's happening with Bitcoin or Europe or Asia or the stock market, right, as long as people are eating peanuts and peanuts are being hauled, it has its own risks mm -hmm. in operations and so forth, but it doesn't have the same correlation to various exogenous variables that a lot of other things have. So within the risks then, when you get into the private lower middle market, uh, first off, you know, there's idiosyncratic risks of any company, you know, customers, your product or service, you know, all those kind of things. What I personally uh, like about smaller businesses is that you can get your hands around those risks. I remember 20 years ago when we were doing, you know, multi-billion dollar, 10, 20 billion dollar M&A deals in investment banking, some of these, you know, multinational companies that we were transacting with, it was so difficult to really get your arms around everything happening. You're kind of hoping you've covered most of these things. When you get to businesses that we invest in, they on average have 120 employees, so we certainly don't know all of them. But we, you know, we really can get to know management. We can get to know the culture, the operations, the business, and those are risks I think of any company. And to avoid them, you really have to, I think, analyze the business. And first off, I think you need to deeply understand the industries and sectors you're investing in. So, for example, we are not experts in real estate. We don't invest in real estate. We don't a little bit invest in it. We don't invest in it, period. There are people that are experts or the energy sector, so forth. And I think people should be specialists in what they do. And um, I think they can then make better informed investment decisions. And they can also manage the assets better, which in the credit world, covenants, data and information is really key. So for us, for example, we have a lot of custom built technology we have um, eight full-time people in India that are working around the clock and really entering data so that we can be, you know, very carefully looking at and watching what's happening with customers, what's happening with revenues. And, and if there are risks, one of the good ways to mitigate risk in general is get in front of it quickly, find it quickly, do something about it. It's the old adage that things usually get worse, not better. And so I think part of risk management, other than avoiding it, it's your best way is to try to get in front of it pretty quickly. And then in private credit, I think one of the things that's important for us at least is having a lot of experience owning companies as private equity partners, as well as C-level executives. So if you do have to take the keys in a really drastic scenario, you understand how to do that. Um, that's obviously getting into a draconian aspect, but that's part of risk management is making sure you're ready for the, the tail risks. So, so really, I'd take out of this two two concepts. One is know what you invest in, and the other is diversify the idiosyncratic risks. And uh, you know, I think that's a a good answer that we can think about in all investment areas. I'm I'm going to ask later about the role of your idea 
in the ideal diversified investment portfolio. So that's kind of a question I want to go to later. But um, Bart, uh, you know, how do you, what can go wrong with emerging market debt and how do you, how do you mitigate it? You know, Jim, it's, it's impossible to default on a zero coupon perpetual bond. <laughs> yes. So, and it doesn't matter who you are or what credit quality you have. You can be subprime or you can be AAA. It's impossible to default. So the reason I'm mentioning that point is that before I answer your question, uh, uh, what could trip this up? As long as money remains free, it's actually going to be very difficult for anything to be tripped up. We do know we have a 500-year financial history that says that when the real interest rate, the real cost of capital is a negative number for an extended period of time, capital gets misallocated and it gets wiped out either through defaults or through inflation, one of the two. There has been no exception to that rule. And I think uh, the same will be the case now, but I do think that could actually take another five years before it materializes. What can go wrong? You know, we are obviously vulnerable uh, to to various geopolitical risks, to various, I mean, obviously climate change is a big risk. So my suspicion is going to be that it's going to come from a kind of an unexpected, uneconomic corner that will uh, will will trip up the apple cart. But uh, in terms of the basic growth, inflation dynamics and G7 monetary policy, I think it could really take a, a fair amount of time before it kills over. Yes, it could take a while. Um, but, you know, I would point out, Bart, that the U.S. 10-year yield, which is probably the best measure of the global cost of capital, has risen to 1.8% at a time when, um, you know, recognizing, as Barbara said, that some commodities have gone up quite a long way, there is no general inflation and that 1.8 is probably the real cost of a 10-year bond. So uh, it doesn't feel too bad in terms of free money, at least in the dollar. Is that a problem to be more aware of internationally? Look, we, we, we are in a synchronized, globalized, um, very low rate cycle. I mean, in a, in a strange way, what we're discussing here is the world becoming like Japan from a, from a rates and an inflation perspective. Obviously, the growth picture is a bit different. But but still, so in 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 the core countries, it's 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 it's. Look, I'm I'm I'm, I'm living. Emerging markets, emerging markets, interest rates are also historically low, but clearly they're still a bit, a fair bit higher than than in the G7. And what you have in emerging markets, which makes it appealing, is that there is, there is a, in the US, you have a safe asset, US treasuries. Nobody questions the credit quality of that. It's a safe asset. In emerging markets, obviously, once you go to the local currency side, the safe asset very quickly gets intertwined with credit risk of some sort, and that creates some interesting opportunities and risks. Yeah. So, um, while each of the ideas might have quite a bit of appeal, um, it's somewhere between a very small part of a retirement portfolio, maybe one or 2%, or on the one hand, all of your retirement portfolio. Um, I'd like to ask a question around the theme of how would you see your favorite asset in terms of a weighting in a retirement portfolio and what other investments might be there to, to spread the risk and to create that diversification that uh, both Bart and Brett talked about. So Barbara, have you got a, some thinking on how you would use your portfolio and how you would construct a, an investment strategy, including it? So it definitely depends on who for, right? I mean, different longevities for different risks. Um, I don't own a single bond, and I feel just fine about that. Um, uh, I believe in diversification. Um, and so I think if you're diversified by geography and sector, that's very important. 
Um, I'm severe, significantly underweight in the U.S. I think I own one U.S. stock. I just think it's expensive, and I find twice the growth, half the multiple outside of the U.S. Um, so, and you know, if if you believe in diversification as I do, you out, you underperform last year because there was only one place to be last year, and that was tech. And uh, and this year, I think it's a very different playbook. Um, I think tech will underperform. Um, and so portfolios need to be um, able to adapt and uh, and move quickly. And that's something big bohemists can't do. You can't turn a super tanker on a dime. So I think smaller, nimble funds that uh, can really do the homework and um, get into opportunities early and um, have the expertise to find them in diverse places and countries should outperform. And so what is that? That's active management. Um, what I wouldn't want to be is uh, tethered to a down market with passive uh, you know, indices because it's worked on the way up. But what people don't realize is you know, that they get tied to it on the way down too. I saw a good example this week, Barbara, of how uh, diversification could help even in volatile tech stocks. Mm-hmm. If you bought a portfolio of internet stocks in 1999, just before, as Brett put it, the unicorns turned into black swans. I love that line, by the way. I'm going to use that. But uh, just before that happened... I, I'll take my royalty check as one of the other sources of yield. Thanks, Jim. Absolutely. I'll pay, I'll pay you that Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, Barbara, the, uh, the point was that if you had 15 stocks in your portfolio and they all went to zero apart from one... If that one was Amazon, you were okay. You made money. And uh, in a way, even then, diversification protected. Um, makes it sound very powerful. Isn't that helpful from the point of view of, of, building, um, of building a portfolio? Absolutely. So diversification is an important part of, of building a portfolio. And I can understand you might have no bonds. Uh, Warren Buffett was famous for for many years. He used to say that in your personal portfolio, the percentage in fixed income should be your age, Mm -hmm. which uh, meant that for him, I guess, it's now 80%. But when he was talking, his fixed income was probably 40%. So it's kind of an interesting idea. You've kind of invented the the, the the life cycle fund. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is, even in his letter, right, Warren Buffett was saying bonds are going to underperform. So if you yeah. ask him that today, I, I think he would have, you know, would review that that comment. But yeah, no, I think that's true. I think that's true. Um, so, uh, Mackenzie, how would you put your uh, your uh, crypto in a portfolio, or would you be wanting your own retirement fund to be a hundred percent crypto? <laughs> Absolutely, not a hundred percent. I'm just seeing more like two, two percent, you know, um, for institutional investors. Um, me personally, me personally, yes, it's a hundred percent, but um, that's not realistic. Um, that's not realistic. Um, within that two percent, I think that um, if you want to try to think about diversification within DeFi or cryptocurrency, Um, you know, just just don't have what everyone's doing right now is kind of, you know, investing in Bitcoin and just saying, okay, well, I have it in my portfolio. I'm good. And that's not that's not true. There's many different types of blockchain networks um, other than Bitcoin and Ethereum that people should really look at. And there's a lot, um, there's a lot of activity in, in China and in Africa as well, um, where they, there are um, unique um, independent blockchain networks um, that are, um, they have really quality code and really quality, uh, really growing traction um, locally, um, locally. So, um, I guess that's the, the best way to diversify. Yeah, that's good. So, Art, any any thoughts on portfolio building for retirement? Um, being having grown up in emerging markets and seeing the tails that mature in it, the way we look at it is actually relatively simple. 
if you're a, if you currently own a treasury or an apple bond yielding 1.7 percent and we're about to issue for our impact bank pref shares at four four and a half percent sell the apple bond and put one third in in what we are issuing yeah. you reduce your capital at risk you reduce your tail you have the current yield i think that's how we think about it so I actually think being conservative and holding decent cash cushions, but then for the remaining, avoiding the mark-to-market losses, you're definitely going to have in these high-grade bonds, I think, is is going to be a winning strategy. Yep. And uh, Brett, your ideas on portfolio building in the last couple of minutes? Sure. I, I always think about investing for goals and objectives and what you're trying to accomplish, and maybe that's from the perspective of, growing up with nothing. And so if you start with nothing, then you say, well, what do you kind of build and what are you trying to achieve? And so I put it in three pretty basic buckets at at this juncture in life. One is capital preservation protection. Um, Two is income generation to live off of. So ideally in life, you get to where you're, you're living off of your assets invested safely and can sleep well at night on that front. And then lastly is your capital appreciation. So I'm not sure it has much to do with your age versus probably your, you know, your your own personal P and L, right? What are what's your income? What are your expenses to figure out, you know, what's what's a portfolio that can help you achieve what you want to achieve that way? Um, I tend to be very focused in illiquid investments as a thesis because I'd rather get paid for illiquidity than risk. I'd also rather generate alpha from services over risk. And so I tend to rather get paid for those type of things and in the investments that, you know, I'm looking at for, for my own portfolio. Um, so I actually don't invest, um, which I don't advise necessarily, but I actually don't invest all in the public markets. Every time I sort of look at them to Barbara's point, I view them as extremely highly valued and hard to rationalize, um, similar to prior to the pandemic, New York real estate, and it continued to, until then, um, exceed uh, what everybody sort of thought was already too high and it kept going. But I find that just difficult um, to find the return. And I think about it as a private investor, if somebody came to me and said, if they showed me the risk reward metrics of the valuations of public debt or, or public equity and said, hey, would you be interested in evaluating this? As a private investor, what we look at, we would say, no way. The metrics would just be so far off what would be acceptable to us. So um, that's a bit of a contrarian view to the world, but we're also, and I'm not a specialist on public assets that way. So that's certainly my my own bias of just not doing what I'm not an expert in. And in your-